Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge brought to you by the Hockey Writers. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Peter Barracchini. And look who it is. The <laughs> old prof is back. He is our uh, daily contributor to the Maple Leafs on the Hockey Writers. But it's summertime and it's hard to get the old prof. So we found him and... Uh, it's so nice to see you again, Mr. Parsons, and we want to catch up with you. It's been a while, and there's been so many changes with the Maple Leafs since the last time we talked. So tell us what you've been thinking of this, uh, what's happened. There's been comers and goers, and there's a, a new kind of vibe around this team. Yeah, I have to admit, and you folks know well, and I, I think my readers know well, that I am the eternal optimist. I, I love hockey. I love watching the game. I love it even in the regular season. I am not one of these people who believes that if they can't win the Stanley Cup, it's all for naught. I, I just really enjoy the game. And I love the stories on the canvas. I love the, the, you know, the stories on the ice and see hockey as a canvas for those stories. But I'm, I'm optimistic. <clears throat> I'm always interested in what general manager Kyle Dubas does. I try to look and see what who he's signing, what he's thinking. Uh, I like the signings that they they've made. Uh, I but that's my way. I I try to figure out who's who they're signing and why they're signing it and what they have in mind for the long run. But I'm optimistic. I think it's uh, very different than la the past postseason where they went for veteran leadership but i think now they're looking they're targeting 25 year olds and they're looking at people coming into their primes and they're hoping they'll hit a home run so i'm really enjoying it and i can't wait to see how it's all going to work out on the ice that said we know that you were a huge fan of zach hyman and uh you wrote plenty of articles about thinking he might stay in toronto and resign in toronto how much did that kind of set, you know, it's, it's a sad moment whenever you lose a fan favorite like that, but how much did that um, impact your thinking around what you're writing about with hockey now, when you see a player that you really thought could resign in Toronto, uh, take more money somewhere else? I didn't just think he could resign. I knew he would resign, which, which shows how smart I am about hockey. Uh, I'm glad for him. I, I thought, I think if I were to guess what he's thinking, family aside, because that was the one that surprised me. I thought his family ties were so strong that that would keep him in, in Toronto. I think he looked at it. He, he's a smart guy. He, if you lo looked at his interviews afterwards with Edmonton, he's a bright young man. He knows he's 29 years old. He knows he's on a seven-year contract. He knows that Ken Holland and the Oilers are going for it now. I think he knows that he's not going to stay for seven years in Edmonton. And I don't think anyone in Edmonton think he's going to stay there for seven years either. So he knew that it was the best offer he had and, and he went for it. What was so funny for me is that I turned sort of on a, there was a moment where I turned and I said, you know what? He's a great guy. I like him. I hope he stays, but I wouldn't sign him for that. And I think Dubas knew it. And I think uh, he just, at that point, I thought he's not a good contract. They shouldn't sign him. And I wished him well wherever he went. Peter, let's uh, kind of refresh things with you too. Um, now that the dust has kind of settled, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of change. This is, we are in the dog days for the next couple of weeks where there's not going to be anything until uh, training camp opens up. Now that we've kind of had some time to digest where things are for the Maple Leafs, how are you feeling around this club? Um, I'm, I still like to remain optimistic, kind of like Jim. Uh, I, I, I try to see the best in everything in the off season and the moves that they try to make to try and improve the club. We thought the same thing last season where we brought in Joe Thornton, Wayne Simmons, Zach Bogosian. We thought that would be the turning point. Um, this year, kind of a different, same mentality, but different approach where instead of going for like older vets, they want to try and get some players still within their prime range experience granted it would be only for like maybe two three four seasons at best but they're looking at as jim mentioned they they're looking to bank on somebody and you know there's michael bunting there's nick richie there's andre kasha uh richie had a pretty good bounce back season with boston kasha was riddled with um or had to deal with a lot of injuries especially with concussions so maybe 
knowing what he was able to do before and his love and of his the numbers in the analytics community, maybe he's a factor that could be a great presence both offensively and defensively. So the signings, I, I still love them. I have no no issues with them. Maybe the David Comp one, I was kind of a bit confused, but knowing his defensive numbers and his play style, similar to that to Riley Nash, I kind of agreed with as I got to learn more about it. But I'm also wondering to see what's going to happen next from here on out. You're still going to have players like Alexander Kerfoot and his contract still reasonable. Granted, he's still probably going to be in that middle six role. Do you try and move him out to try and gain help in the top six? Um, you're also going to look at a lot of players that are were on the roster last year still battle for a spot like Pierre Engvall and Ilya Mikheyev. Do you try and ship those guys out? Travis Dermott as well. So you have a lot of options to try and move players out and still add in a key piece either on defense or up front in that top six or middle six role as well. I got to admit, I like talking to you guys because I'm a little bit worried about this team, to be honest. I think it's <laughs> going to be a challenge for them in, in the Atlantic with when you look at the Boston Bruins, Tampa Bay, Carolina, Florida, like there's a lot of great teams. We know that that division is the best in hockey and uh, Boston's done a lot of moves and I'm just not, I'm not confident yet at the same time, Sheldon Keefe, I think is a good coach and he's going to have to prove it this year. He's got some new pieces in there. He's we've seen how he can really uh, um, change young players around. And uh, that's what he's got a lot more of after this free agent period to, to guys that he can work with and uh, maybe that are more system driven. So I'm hopeful, but it's going to be a challenge this regular season. A lot of people look at it and go, well, it doesn't matter until the playoffs. This regular season is going to be one of the most competitive regular seasons, I think for the Leafs to get a playoff spot. That's going to be a tough, tough division to play in. So I'm always glad to talk to you guys to get my hopes uh, raised back up again. <laughs> Let's uh, move on then to uh, the old prof's most recent article, and it's on five players that are on the bubble because they're, you know, that that locker room got a little bit bigger over the uh, past couple of weeks with a lot of uh, less expensive contracts. So tell us a little bit about that article, Jim, and uh, who are these players that, that you've got on the bubble right now? Well, let me go back one step before that. One of the things I noticed was that the hirings that uh, uh, when Dave Hassel went to the Seattle, who they hired. And once I saw uh, who they hired as their assistant coaches, what was the common among them was their player development. And then I thought, you know what? I think they're going to bring a lot of the kids up. I think they're going to really make some space for those people. Then they went out and got the former coach of the Hershey Bears, who was the AHL coach of the year. Then they brought in, I think, Ryan Hardy is, is the fellow's name from the, from the USHL, who's a, amazing. Once I read, I didn't know him, but once I read about him, I thought, this guy's a keeper. And then I thought, you know what, they're really hiring well. They have to be going for that. And then I sort of looked who they were hire, who they were signing. And really, I said before that they were signing people around 24, 25, nobody much older than that, maybe a 29 year old. But, you know, I think that they're really going. So <clears throat> I looked at it and I'll just mention one of the young fellows who I really didn't know either. And uh, who is his name is Manel. So uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. So Brandon Manel, who uh, was with the Minnesota, who chose because he was stuck in the Minnesota defenseman system to go to the KHL. He went to the KHL. He's a, he's a, he, and he just, he just amazed me. He, he was the highest uh, averaging. He averaged more ice time than anyone else there. And he, I think he's going to, I think they hope he can run the power play and quarterback the power play. And that's what it looks like he's able to do which goes back to what's happening with Morgan Riley. So I really look at that. I think that I don't know what's going to happen with these folks. Uh, what I'm seeing is that Dubas is signing people at high salary or league minimums, but high minor league salaries. 
And that makes me wonder how come. So I think that might help these guys pass through waivers if they have to, because they know if they put him down in the minors, they're going to have to pay him 400000 which I think. So I'm really looking at those bubble players and I'm thinking, how will they, how are they going to engage the roster? And it's so, I like the movement. I, I always see uh, Dubas going for the home run like he did with Gelsenyuk yet last year. So, you know, I'm just, I'm really interested in how that roster shapes up and what they're thinking and where they're going with that. So I just went, I was saying, okay, it's sort of like the dominoes, right? If this one tips this way, where's the next one going? Where's the next one going? That's the way I'm sort of looking at it and trying to make sense of what's going on. I don't, I know I didn't answer your question very much, but it's that line of thinking that really is intriguing to me and what that means for the team going forward. No, and of course, and you can check out that article on the hockeywriters.com uh, to see about these five bubble players. But Peter, let's expand on that too with, with the hirings around these younger type players about the player development. I know that you liked uh, Hardy when he was signed. You told us all about uh, his time in Chicago. Uh, are we on to something there that they're looking or is this... You know, maybe it's just Dubas really, he still loves those Marlies. Maybe he's going for that Calder Cup championship again. <laughs> um, I think it's a bit of both. I think he, you can't deny the fact of what Hardy did with the Chicago Steel. And not only that, we drafted Matthew Nyes, um, who was a USHL player with the Tri-City Storm. So I'll start, uh, I read that he did have COVID-19 to start a season, but managed to pick his play up. So you have that USHL scouting um factor coming in with Ryan Hardy because he's probably familiar with a lot of the teams at that level. So he probably had a say when Dubas was talking to him, if he comes over, you could, you could rest assured that nice is going to be under his development as well. But I think also you still want to keep your farm system intact and you want them to be ready for when they do make the job. Um, uh, for example, Nick Robertson and Timothy Lilligren, um, two players that have been in the AHL recently um, had their times and stints up in the NHL Good results could use some improvement, but I think right now with what happened last season, depending if they're going to start off there, you want them to be ready for when they come up. And I think they're just nearing that completion. Um, I, I'm just going to try to use that completion check mark to say, hey, yeah, you're graduated from the AHL. Use your time to the NHL. So I think it's a mix of both. You still want them. You want to get as much talent in to keep your prospect pool um, you know, as deep as possible. So that way when players like a Zach Hyman, like a Morgan Riley move on out, you have players that are nearing completion or are already close to taking their spot already. So I think it's a mix of both right then and there. This is the Maple Leafs Lounge brought to you by the Hockey Writers. Make sure you follow us on all your favorite social media platforms and like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. We always like all the comments and feedback. And if you want some topics, make sure to reach out and uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, get to the bottom of it. Now, there has been a defense. If you are an up-and-comer in hockey right now and you're a forward because you love scoring goals, I got some advice. Forget about it. Get back <laughs> to the blue line. Become a defenseman because they are getting paid right now. We saw Seth Jones with well over what 9.25, and now Darnell Nurse has cashed in with a major contract as well, north of the nine million mark. This, these are just incredible numbers going out for defensemen, and it has me thinking. I was already thinking it, but now it's kind of cemented that Morgan Riley is done in Toronto. And it, it's not even for the sake that Morgan Riley has been there for a long time. And uh, maybe it's time for him to move on, or maybe this is about play or whatever. That's not it. There is just no possible way they can afford Morgan Riley. He's getting 5 million right now. This is the last year of his contract. Even if, who knows? Everyone's got different stats that they look at for how much they're going to be paying whoever, but Dougie Hamilton's of the world are getting paid a lot of money right now. And so you got to say that Morgan's at least going to be in that 8 million range just by the recent signings. He has to at least be at 8 million. So 
if you're Kyle Dubas and you're looking at that, where do you come up with three million more dollars on that roster right now to sign an extension with Morgan Riley? Of course, he said the things you're supposed to say that I'd love to stay in Toronto and I, I would take less to be in Toronto. These are all the things that they're supposed to say. But at the end of the day, this is a business, as we talked about with Zach Hyman. And uh, I, I this is going to be a very tough situation because Toronto is supposed to be uh, a contender. They're going to have to be trading Morgan Riley to probably a contender or somebody that's very close. And they're going to need somebody back that is going to cost less for re-signing or is already under a contract that is less, but still has a pretty good talent because we do have the Sandines and Lilligrens of the world that could come up. But Morgan Riley is a good talent. And to try to replace that is going to be difficult on a trade at this point. So Kyle Dubas has his work cut out for him as always. Peter, is that the nail in the coffin, these recent signings of defensemen? And where do you see the Morgan Riley situation going? Um, if it isn't at the moment, it's going to be down the line. Um, you know, during the draft beforehand, when call, uh, Chicago and Columbus made that trade and Seth Jones signed, signed for 9.5, that's at the market for, you know, top and tier end defensemen. Although I don't think Seth Jones is quite at that level compared to a Dougie Hamilton who signed for 9 million on the open market. Kale McCarr, who also signed making less than Seth Jones and he's a back-to-back Norris trophy candidate. So, you know, it, it definitely did set the market. And even I think Miro Heiskin and his contract sort of jumped start that as well. But looking at what, what is going to happen right now, even Darnell Nurse's contract, 9.25. I love Darnell Nurse. I still would not take him at that high of a value. If you're, if, if you're Morgan Riley right now, you're going to say, well, you know, I'm a better player than Seth Jones. I'm a better player than, you know, Darnell Nurse. I, I, I'm, you're probably not going to get that argument with Kale McCarr or Miro Heiskin or Dougie Hamilton, but Dougie Hamilton, his underlying numbers show that he's a better offensive driver. Morgan Riley has sort of, you know, been inconsistent at times. So, is he going to get that nine million? I don't know, but he's definitely going to look in to cash in and get his values, and rightfully so, just like Zach Hyman, just like everybody else. But if he is in the market for nine million, you're you're going to have to get rid of your depth, and you're looking at Alex Kerfoot, you're looking at Ilya Mikheyev, you're looking at Pierre Engvall, guys who are making millions of dollars right now. That you know, is it worth trying to keep Morgan Riley in the fold, or do you still want to have those? middle tier two-way contracts like you do have with Jacob Musson, like you do with TJ Brody. And, you know, you mentioned Sandine. Sandine is perfect possible replacement for the future. And it's going to, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to be that replacement. We saw what he did in that one game against Vancouver, um, you know, playing top tier minutes, shutting them down, doing what he does best on the power play. Um, granted, some mistakes in the playoffs, including, you know, the turnover in game six against Montreal or game five against Montreal, we saw what happened there, but you know what? There's a lot of promise with him. So um, if you are trying to sign Morgan Riley and it's not going anywhere, I think the best thing to do is just try and trade him, get as much value as you can right now, get a top prospect, get a first round pick. This year's draft is looking pretty good, much better than 2020 right now. So if you have two first round picks and if you, if you could try and trade it and get another asset back, then by all means go for it. Cause I just, I just don't see it having a happy ending at this point. No, and that's the, the hardest part of this. I understand the, the thought about trading, but when this is supposed to be a contender, that's one year past where they were supposed to get to a, a place where we haven't seen this team in a long time. Uh, how do you let go of the guy that right now is your number one uh, defenseman on the power play? He gets the big minutes you know, to, to give him up right now for a first round draft pick and have that hole in your roster. Um, that's a, that's a tough position for this team to be in. So, uh, Jim, where, where do you see this one playing out? I'm surprised he's still on the team actually. Uh, and I think that was one of the biggest, if I, if I were going to name one of the biggest unanswered questions, that's, that's it. It just strikes me that if I were Dubas, and I'm not, but if I were, <clears throat> I would say, I'm not gonna let another internal rental go. I'm gonna trade them before <clears throat> I have to give them up for nothing. And that's a, that's a, I think that would, that's a key. And I wouldn't be surprised if something happens. 
that set. And one of the interesting things that Dubas has done with all these signings this year is he's left salary cap space for a, a, a trade deadline deal, I think. So I think there's space that they, I mean, it was a debacle last year what he had to go through to get Felino to the team. It was just crazy. Uh, and, but he did it and he's a magic, but at the same time, I, I think he learned from that and I think he's leaving some space. So I'm, I don't know what will happen to Riley. I like Riley. I think he's captain material. I think he's an amazing spokesman and a very professional athlete. Uh, he's a good guy and uh, I, I'd like to see him stay, but given what we talked about with Hyman, I, it just isn't going to happen. And I, I, so I, I, I just think it's time to, time to move him and time to depend on the young kids. And Sandine has shown brilliance. I, I was thinking as, as Peter was talking that every once in a while in a post, I make a spelling mistake. Does that mean I'm a bad writer? I don't think so. Oh, every once in a while on the ice, Sandine makes a mistake. Does that mean he's a bad player? I don't think so. It means that you make mistakes. And that's the way why hockey is so darn much fun because people make mistakes and there's a sort of, oh, nuts, here we go. You know, and it goes the other way. So that's the fun of it all. And so people make mistakes. We depend on mistakes for the action. Without a mistake, we got no, we got nothing going on. So of course they're going to make mistakes. So good for them, right? Keep making mistakes, boys, because that's what makes the, the whole thing fun. So I think he'll make mistakes. I think he'll continue to make mistakes. I think when he's 38 years old, he'll make mistakes. So yeah, he makes a mistake. We all make mistakes. So And Jack Campbell lets in a soft goal on game seven. <laughs> Only one of the playoffs, right? Is he a bad goalie? Don't think so. Ah. <laughs> uh painful memories <laughs> well we'll try to get by that one i i want to i want to watch a game with you someday though jim and and ah nuts there's a turnover <laughs> ah nuts that's not exactly what i say but <laughs> <laughs> um i've still got it in my head and i know i'm not letting this go but uh, i see maybe a trade to seattle and you get penny Oleksiak's brother to toronto with some <laughs> space and uh and maybe some other prospects there, but I'm not going to let go of Jamie Oleksiak just yet. And congratulations to Penny Oleksiak and the rest of team Canada. Holy cow. What a performance there in Japan. And uh, that's one of the cool things that we get to look forward to with the Maple Leaf season is when all the Olympians will be recognized before um, the puck drops and uh, they'll be doing the ceremonial puck drops. And won't it be cool to see that um, in when the uh, ice is ready to go one more time. This is the Hockey Writers. Make sure you head on over to thehockeywriters.com and go under the Maple Leafs tab for all the information from the old prof, Peter Barracchini, and the rest of our great writing staff. Now, Peter, you put up an article and you've kind of mentioned these players and it kind of is a good bow tie to everything that we've been saying so far, but you talked about the three young guys that could really uh, turn the tide for Toronto and maybe make some roster adjustments a little bit easier. So tell us a little bit about that article. You've alluded to it already a few times, but uh, there are three guys that could really change things for Toronto. Yeah, I talked about like setting realistic expectations for the opportunities of Rasmus Sandin, Nick Robertson, and Timothy Lilligren. And basically, I just like wanted to set the tone that, you know, they got players coming up in the pipeline that they're on the edge of making the roster. They're going to come in with a mentality and they're going to do their best. So um, basically highlighting Rasmus Sandin, I already talked about it. His presence is to solidify that third, that third pairing spot. And that was supposed to be his. He didn't quite make it, got injured, didn't come back until April. And he was up with the team. And then he got in nine games and he uh, tallied four assists. But it was his play against elite level competition. And I found a, a source called Puck IQ where it tallies like the percentage of his ice time against, you know, high end competition, medium and, you know, low level competition. And Rasa Sandin had, you know, a shots for percentage of 60.5 and it was only faced against elite level competition, 16.4 at the time. So that just shows that whenever he was playing against the best, he made an impact to show that, you know, he's capable of playing up against them and making an impact offensively, defensively, 
and uh, shutting down when he needs to, and even making a big hit every now and then. We saw what he did uh, to Blake Wheeler against the Winnipeg Jets that one game. So there's a lot of promise for him to be that top pairing defenseman, but the main point is for him to just solidify that third spot, continue to do what he does, and maybe even get uh, still see some of that second line or even first line power play minutes, depending on what happens. If if Keith is going to keep Riley, so be it. If not, Sandine is able to do that as well. Nick Robertson is an interesting situation because he has the potential to be the top six. That's the ceiling right then and there. But there's some things that he still needs to work on. Um, if he does need to get a little bit stronger, he has shown that he does have the strength. Just needs to find that consistency a little bit. But, you know, he is he does have the mentality right now that he wants to push for a spot and he's going to do whatever it takes to get to that point. And, you know, good on him for having that attitude and mentality because that's what every prospect in the system should have at this point. But even if he doesn't make the roster, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe he does, especially in like a third line role, possibly, and also depending on what happens with other forwards like McKay of Kerfoot and Engball. If he's able to solidify that third spot, he already has a spot on the roster and he's able to learn and get better through throughout the season and potentially push for that second line spot in the near future. If not, if he does get sent down, it just fuels the fire for him even more. So it's either, it's going to be a win-win situation for him. I mean, not really because, you know, you want to make the roster and you get sent down. It's a bit, you know, deflating, but I think he's going to come back stronger than ever. And we saw what he was able to do. His brother, Jason was putting up great numbers with Dallas and was a finalist for the Calder trophy. So, you know, that both of them are going to want to play against each other at some point and put their best foot forward. So I'm looking forward to that matchup as well. And then Timothy Lilligren, um, final roster spot is going to come down to the right-hand side. And I think it's his to take. Um, I, I think he's ready to make that big step. We saw his consistency defensively rushing the play last season with the Marlies. I'm hoping we're going to see that continuing this year. And uh, Kyle Dubas alluded to that both Sandine and Lilligren have a chance to take an opportunity in the spot and run with it. And this is obviously, I mentioned Sandine, but this is also Lilligren's time. And both Sandine and Lilligren were also defensive partners with the Marlies. And even early on during exhibition games, and even I think one time during the regular season, if I'm not mistaken. So they have that familiarity. They have that chemistry. If they're a final third pairing, I have no doubts in my mind that they're going to do great things because I have great faith in them. It's funny how fast time goes by because Lilligren was first round draft pick in 2017. And, you know, we're, we're a lot of years past that now as time is flying by. And this is kind of it. As far as I can tell if you can't make the jump now, I don't think you're going to make the jump. Um, and it's, I think that's on his shoulders to also, um, do this. And when you look, 2017 was the year after the first round selection was Austin Matthews, you know, so you're kind of talking about a guy that made an impact right away as a first round draft pick for the Leafs. And then the next year's first round draft pick still hasn't made a mark on that roster. So it's, it's time to, it's time to go um, and, and make some moves here. So, so uh, Jim, this kind of, gives you a second chance on your players on the bubble. Cause a lot of those guys were young guys too. Uh, can you add to some of those younger guys that can kind of shake up the roster for the Leafs? I don't know who's going to shake up the roster. I, I like the, I like the signings. Uh, I was thinking as uh, Peter was talking about Adam Brooks, what's going to happen to him. You're talking about kids who could be good, right? I'm uh, I'm, I'm anxious to see, uh, I, I wrote a post about Bogosian. and he played well. It was time for him to leave. He left. And so I think it's time for uh, the, the Maple Leafs organization to put some trust in both Sandine and Lilligren and see, see how they do. I, I'm really not surprised at, at that. Uh, I, I, I agree. I think uh, Robertson's will probably be in the Marley simply because he can be moved. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, if I were going to play him, I'd only play him in the top six, but then, you know, I just, I don't see him as a third line option. I think, I think Robertson's a great young player. I think he's going to turn into somebody we haven't seen, which is I, he's known for his goal scoring. I think he's going to become Mitch Marner. I think he's going to be an assist guy. Really? 
and score more assists than goals. That's that's my call on that looking looking forward because he has such good he has a he has a lot of vision on on the thing. He he sort of got caught in forechecking too deep and stuff like that. You know things that he could learn how to do. But I just think he's a great young player. I don't think he's going to make the roster this season. Uh, if he does, I hope it's in the top, uh, top six. Uh, I think, uh, Kase is, a, a home run. <laughs> I, I, I hope that he's able to play. I think if he is able to play, I think he'll probably be on the, be on the long-term in- injury reserve. Uh, that's my call. I don't, I, I can't see that he's, he's, he's had five concussions in five years. So, you know, but he's a, he's a good player. So if he can score, that's uh, uh, if he can play, that would be really strong for the team. You know, they're on the bubble because I just don't know if the bubble is going to pop or not. It's just it's it's very interesting to to see. But I like uh, I like the signings. I think Richie has uh, has an opportunity to be strong. I don't know if I would play him on the top line with Matthews or because I I read. I do. I've been doing my homework, uh, trying to get better at what I'm doing for the hockey writers. And two of the things I do is I read everybody else's column who writes stuff for the for the Maple Leafs just to see what they're thinking. And there's a lot of support for Richie as a, he'll score. One person said, I guarantee he'll score 30 goals this season. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Uh, and I'm also trying to learn analytics. Uh, I should because I'm a sort of a academic stats guy right so but i didn't really engage it so the analytics suggests that sandine is really the best defenseman they have (laughs) offensively he's the best offensive defenseman small number but still he's on top so it's very interesting so i'm i'm anxious to see where where these young fellows are going i i really I really would be un, I'd be unhappy a bit to see Riley go. I think he will go, and I think it's time to trust the team with the with the young defenseman. So let's sort of wrap things up now with our social media roundup. And last week we got to uh, send our congratulations along to Mitch Marner, who got engaged. This week, it was Ilya Mikheyev who got engaged, so congratulations to him. But as was pointed out, uh, we hope the wedding's not in spring because we don't know if the guys will show up. (laughs) I had to go there again. Come on, we kind of have a little Uh... bit of fun on here. Come on. Um, One other post that I saw that was, uh, you know, because we've talked a lot about the free agent signings and things like that and the craziness I'm sure you guys saw over in the NBA, Steph Curry signed $54 million a year. $54 million a year. Buffalo's entire roster right now is $53 million. So Steph Curry is making more than the entire Sabres. So, I mean, Steph uh, deserves it. So Yeah, that guy's amazing <laughs> to watch. But holy cow, um, $54 million. You know what? I should revise the earlier one where they were saying if you're if you're liking scoring goals to get back on D, maybe just forget about it and get out on the basketball court. Yeah, fifty four million dollars. Holy cow, uh, Peter! What did you see on social media this week? Um, I, I saw a lot of things. I mean, I mean that's very basic, but um, a lot of the Olympic <laughs> a lot of the Olympic posts, athletes winning their gold medals, Damian Warner, Andre de Grasse. The Canadian women's soccer team, that was just very uplifting. Um, seeing um, the LaBay comment or someone changing her Wikipedia page to the National Defense Minister of Canada. So <laughs> very deserving after what she did during the penalty kicks and the actual gold medal game too. So that's deserving. Uh, hockey-wise, um, Josh Cloak did a little mini-series on how I spent my summer vacation featuring some of the Maple Leafs. And he posted a picture of... Pierre Engvall, Mitch Marner, and Justin Hall. But the one of Austin Matthews is a picture of him playing giant chess. And I don't know if you're able to see that right there, but... Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, Austin Matthews, noted chess enthusiast, I guess, right now. So, that was actually kind of interesting to see. Hmm. Jim, we know you're, you don't always uh, go around on the social media as much, but uh, lots of comments on your articles. Um, 
We try to keep it a little bit positive here because I know you had some heat on the Frederick Anderson, but uh, anything stick out to you on uh, what you saw on the web this week? Well, just in general, the, the power of disappointment of fans for this team is just palpable in a sense that they are so disappointed and so downcast about the team. And uh, it's been, uh, and that was in part, part of the Anderson thing. He, my unforgivable sin was that he, he, he just couldn't win in the playoffs. Uh, But it's, it's a, that's the general sense I have that, that fans are really, uh, I, I wrote a post about just the rising expectations for this team, because before 2016, 17, if they made the playoffs, that's good, right? Then they had that sort of breakout season. What a surprise. And now anything less than the Stanley Cup isn't good enough. So, and I I think my post suggested be ready to be disappointed because everything has to go right to win the, to win the playoffs. So when you're, when you're my age, you sort of sit back and enjoy what you can enjoy and you sort of miss a little bit what you can't do anymore but at the same time hockey is a great game and i'm sad for fans who put everything invested in if it isn't the stanley cup it's simply not good enough because i think they miss so much of the the possibility so i encourage just fans to sort of relax and enjoy the the game for what it is and the skill levels and the ability of these people what amazing skills they have to skate quickly, to handle the puck. It's just an amazing game. And, and I just invite us all to sort of enjoy it and, and see it for what it is. It's, it's not the end of the world. It's not global warming. It's guys playing against each other who probably are just, a, they're probably great friends off the ice. Matthews and McDavid hang out, right? They play each other. They're going to go at it, but still it's a fun game and could be a fun game. And, I invite us all to relax and enjoy it. That goes to a, a tweet this week. I saw as a, a, from a fan that was a first had enjoyed hockey for the first season and said, what advice would you give to someone who is just starting to follow NHL hockey? I think mine would be not to get emotionally attached. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one more from Chris Cuthbert uh, with a side-by-side with DeGrasse and McDavid trying to digest the fact that Andre DeGrasse top speed, 41.9 kilometers per hour in the 100 meter is better than Connor McDavid's top speed on ice. Didn't know wow. that. Wow. Wow, eh? So... And I'll leave it on one more because uh, this guy gets more talk than anyone else. It was just a thread on Elliot Friedman, who was, you know, he just uh, throws up on his Twitter when he sees a signing and it could be players we've never heard of. And there was a guy that uh, came over from the KHL and one guy just uh, just responded to him saying, stop tweeting unless it's the Eichel trade. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so you know that guy's got la friedman pinned on the top and is just waiting for friedman to, to say the big news and he keeps on getting alerts and they're they're not the ankle trade so <laughs> but thank you Elliot friedman for sticking on it for for all the players even if it's not jack eichel yeah. and thank Absolutely. you so much for uh joining us this week on the Maple Leafs Lounge brought to you by the Hockey Raiders. It was so great to catch up with the old prof and to check in with Peter Barrettini as well. We will see you back here in one week's time where we will have plenty more to talk about. Make sure to uh, like and subscribe to this channel and leave some comments below on content that you would like us to chat about. Have a great week, everybody. And like Jim says, just enjoy the day. Enjoy.